Um, I'm Leila Halal, Director of the Middle East Program at New America. And we have with us today Alex Pollack. Uh, of, he is Director of the Microfinance and Micro uh, Credit Department at the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. And he's currently based in Jerusalem. He is a seasoned and very successful microfinance practitioner with 22 years experience in the Middle East. He turned UNRWA's microfinance program into a self-sufficient and profitable multinational microfinance entity operating through its Jerusalem headquarters <coughs> and four regional offices in Palestine, Jordan, and Syria, and through a network of 23 branch offices spread across the region. Under his leadership in the microfinance uh, and microcredit department, UNRWA ha became the second largest and first fully financially sustainable financial operation in Syria. Um, that's quite a success. Um, and for the past few years, Alex has worked to adapt UNRWA's microfinance work in Syria admit, admits the armed conflict. And part of this work has included um, producing quarterly socioeconomic updates on the uh, situation in Syria, uh, given the armed conflict. And he's done this work in collaboration with the Syrian Center for Policy Research and the UNDP uh, in, in Syria. He regularly visits Syria, um, amongst other uh, areas of operation. Um, where UNRWA works, and he is here today to discuss the latest report um, put out uh, w with the Syrian Center for Policy Research and the UNDP, Syria War <laughs> on Development Socioeconomic Monitoring Report. Um, it covers April to June 2013, and we have copies available outside um, for, for you um, as you exit. Today. So with that, Alex, I'm going to turn it over okay. to you and ask you to summarize the report and, and some of the key findings. Okay, before I do that, I would just like to explain a little bit about who the Syria Center for Policy Research are, who we're working with in Syria. They're a group of young academics. Um, uh, they're, they're very concerned to remain independent from any side in, in the war. And also, they're very concerned about who finances the research. So they're working with, the U working with the UN on this, but they're very concerned not to be seen as, um, as party to any side. So one of the things they want to do is to make sure that we keep their independence um, uh, as, as, as very clear. And so they're not supporting government, they're not supporting opposition, but they're dependent, highly dependent on data from, um, from government services. So the report is based on, on, on taking government service data and then modeling it to show the, 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 the range of impacts of the armed conflict on the economy. Um, now, methodologically, I'll just very briefly say what, how, they're, how they're developing the methodology. This is based on a counterfactual me methodology where they're taking, they're, ta they're taking the economy up to the period of 2010 and then projecting, uh, projecting growth and other factors uh, as, as up to the current period. So that would be the eco what the economy would look like as if there had been normal progression and the conflict had not emerged. And then they're taking the current, um, the current trends within the economy and, and then projecting them out. And then the gap between the, gap between the, the continuing trend and the actual trend is the band on which they're basing their, their economic analysis. Um, so it, it's, it's all projection, but projection based, based, on, based on economic modeling and financial modeling. Um, so if I could just go directly to the economy, be a bit more, we, the center developed a report in 2010 that covered, uh, 2012, that covered the whole of 2012. And we have contracted them to do quarterly studies so that we can see the, the, the changes within the economy and how that's affecting the lives of people. And the main focus of the report is not on either party in the conflict, but on looking, o looking at what the economic and social conditions uh, of the Syrian population as a whole look like. Um, now that means, so if I just give you some of the key data, um, I think the, 
in this second half of 2013, there was a major, th th there's been a restructuring of the economy as the GDP has diminished quite dramatically. And the, the major um, change that has occurred that with massive deindustrialization um, of the economy, the agricultural sector has assumed uh, a leading role in, in, in GDP. So in the second half of, of this year, agriculture accounted for 54% of GDP. Uh, in, the in 2010, it accounted for 27%. So you've had a big turnaround in the economy with agriculture now account accounting for a huge part of it. But as agriculture is accounting for a larger share of the economy, it's actually shrinking. So the value of the agricultural economy in two th the second half in 2012 is less than it was in 2010. So that gives you some idea of the impact of, of, of what's going on in the economy. Now, deindustrialization has taken place through a number of factors. Uh, first of all, you've had a, lot, you've had a significant flight of capital uh, um, as people move businesses and resources outside the country. Some have moved to Turkey, a few have moved to Egypt. Um, but the most, the most dramatic effect on that period is since the beginning of the conflict, the, the economy has lost $103 billion. Um, it's lost $50 billion from its GDP. Um, and the most, the most, the most dramatic impact of the future, it's lost all, all just over 50 million dollars. Well, it, it's lost 88 million dollars, uh, sorry, 88 billion dollars, excuse me, 88 billion dollars on its capital stock. Its capital stock has been diminished dramatically, and in any future reflation of the economy, or reconstruction of the economy, all those, in, those investments will have to be, to be restored. Now, the capital stock has been, been lost through, uh, through, um, through capital flight, but also through looting and destruction of existing businesses. So uh, much of the damage to the, to the economy has been through looting and destruction. Um, uh, so that, and, uh, that includes agriculture, it includes housing stock, it, inclu it includes in industrial stock. Um, so the GDP has contracted in the first quarter of 2000, 2013 by a third, it contracted by 40% in the second half. So there's a massive downswing in the economy that's having major impact throughout the structure of the economy. So in, in that context, we, we've lost, uh, the Syrian economy has lost 2.3 million jobs, which means almost 10 million people are dependent on, on, on their livelihood support for those 2.3 million jobs. So half of the people in Syria, almost half, have lost, have lost any, any support for, for employment. Currently, in, the, in the, the first half of the year, the unemployment rate was um, was, was just over 48 percent. That had gone down by two percent from the previous quarter, um, which was over 50 percent. And the reason was, second half of the year is the, is the peak time for agriculture. So, agriculture, uh, short-term agriculture employment reduced the unemployment rate, but that's that will come back up to over 50 percent <coughs> in, in the next quarter. Um, so private investment also has contracted massively. It contracted by 23%. It's already down by 70% from 2012, but uh, from two, between 2011 and 2012. But it contracted by 23% in the first quarter of 2013, and therefore that 12.8% in, in the second quarter. Um, and the total investment in the economy is, is just 10.3% of GDP, which is actually less than the depreciation of capital stock in general. So that also shows that any new investments going into the economy are not keeping up with the de depreciation rate. So again, an, a shrinking economy, an economy that's no longer to sustain the livelihoods of people. So the economy is in, is in a state of, ru of ruination. Um, let me just turn to some of the other factors Private consumption is also contracting, contracted by 40% in the first quarter of 2003 and 47% in the second quarter. Now, what does that mean in terms of people's lives and livelihoods? It means that people are no longer purchasing what they were in the past. And the, the reason for that is people do not have incomes. Poverty is, is increasing. Um, by the second, the, the second half of, of this year, between the beginning of the conflict um, in that 27-month uh, period, uh, we had the 7.9 million people were, uh, sorry, 
uh, 7.9 million people became unemployed. And these, uh, sorry, poor. These were the new poor. 4.4 million of them lived below um, the. They were in deep poverty and were not able to to uh, to, uh, to finance their, their basic needs. So you have a massive destruction in the economy that's been led by a number of by many many factors. Uh, government resources. Um, in terms of unemployment, government no longer has the uh, no longer has the tax base it used to have, so it's lost lost 2.3 million incomes, which means income tax VAT. So the government government um, fiscal policy is also facing major reduction because it cannot meet many of the basic needs. At the same time, uh, there's been deflation in the co uh, th there's been the cost of living has risen by over 200 percent. It's projected to rise by 300 percent by the end of the year. Um, now, what that means is that people on fixed income, public sector workers, and others are being are being pitched into poverty because their income is only buying half what it was two years ago. Um, and at the same time, there's been massive rise in the cost of foodstuffs, partially because of of, of, of the international. Um, sanctions, but also also because of the reduction in production of goods and services inside Syria, which is actually pushing up the prices of, of, of goods and services for the whole people. So if I turn to some of the socioeconomic indicators rather, rather than the economic indicators, um, we can see um, that Syria now has the fastest growing refugee population of any country in the world, and by the end of the year, it's likely to be the largest population, refugee population, in the, um, worldwide, overtaking Afghanistan with um, with 22.4 million people. So really, you're, you're going to see a, a, most of those people are moving to largely to to Lebanon and um, and Jordan, and that's putting huge pressures on on the domestic economies of those countries who are trying to cope with that. And a lot a lot of the international aid. Has, has a strong focus on Jordan, uh, and, jo uh, Jordan and Lebanon at the moment. Um, just Within that context of the movement of people, about the, the, the population has been hollowed out by over eight percent. So you have you have what, what, um, when we when we produced the report, we were, it was 1.73 million refugees um, within the region, but another 1.3 million. Um, persons who'd actually who'd actually migrated voluntarily. Um, so there's a mixture of refugee and migration going on, but also you have massive internal displacement, often multiple times. Oh, fi almost five million people have been internally displaced within Syria from different parts of Syria. Um, a large part in Damascus, Alep Aleppo, um, Idlib, Homs, Hama, there's been massive displacement, and there are also, so large-scale displacement often multiple times as people move to seek shelter and safe havens and other places those places then become themselves become unsafe and people have to move and uh, many times one of the factors in internal displacement are people are moving from nuclear family households into extended family households so for example people who live in a household of of mother and father and, and, and four, three or four children are now moved into households where You've got grandparents, brothers and sisters, and their families and children. So up, up to uh, in, in, cent in the central Damascus area, where many people have moved into, you have uh, households, extended households of up to 30 people living in a house for six people. So that has been putting huge pressures on, on people. But what it's meaning is that there's a, uh, because, of the, because of the loss to the economy, because of loss of income, Households have had to come together to support each other with less resources than they had a few years ago. Um, no, um, now, in terms of what would happen, just to put the context of of the economic losses um, in, in a broader context, if the economy was began to reflate today at a sort of at 5% a year, it would take the Syrian economy 30 years to get back to where it was in 2010. So you can see from that that the economic losses have been have been massive. Um, now, one of the explain that though, 30, 30 years recovery. 
uh, we take 30 years to recover to the same level of GDP that Syria had in 2010, and with a, a current growth level of 5% per year. So compounding year by year, it takes 30 years to get back to where it was. Now, a lot of those losses are, are um, they're not going to be, it's not, I mean, clearly, it's not, any reconstruction is not going to take place like that. It will be a huge investment in the beginning period, which will, refl will refloat the economy, but it won't take it up to the necessary level because there's been a massive outflow within the, within the refugee population and the migrant population. <coughs> there's been a massive outflow of human capital. So if you just take some of the basic statistics from the, from the health sector, um, the number of doctors per, uh, num number of n uh, n the sort of uh, doctor population ratio has gone from one doctor for 700 people to one doctor to 4, 4, just over 4,000 people. So that shows a, a large scale outflow of um, healthcare professionals from the, sec from the sector, <coughs> um, either <coughs> moving, moving on into the refugee population or being part of displaced people or actually migrating to the Gulf and other countries looking, looking for employment. Now in the healthcare sector as well, we also have massive, massive loss to infrastructure, but 30% of the, of the public ho hospitals are no longer operating effectively. 50% of the primary healthcare services are dysfunctional. The, uh, w one of the issues, th one of the key issues there are m most chronically sick and long-term people require long-term medicines and long-term services. They get most of the services through the primary health care se primary healthcare sector. The primary health care sector is no longer able to service many of those people. Um, but at the same time, even when, they ha even when they're open, many of the health care centers don't have access to the drugs um, and dialys dialysis that they need to, to provide. The so many, many chronically ill people are, are now become, uh, falling into seri serious, uh, serious health conditions that, n that, n that may lead to their deaths. The other factor on that is we, the estimation is that, that over, over 100,000 100, people have been, have been killed during, during the war. It's also estimated that um, on a ratio of one, uh, of one to four, about 2% of the Syrian population have been killed, maimed, or injured in the war. Uh, so we're talking about a very large, uh, about 2% of the population. Um, um, now, looking at the education side, there's a major crisis going on in the education sphere. Only half of all school children are currently in school. Um, there's also been large-scale damage to uh, to many schools. Three thousand schools are no. Can you raise your voice just a yeah, little bit? Sorry, three thousand schools are no longer operating. S uh, over six hundred are now. Um, displacement centers for, for displaced people, so they're, they're not functioning. Now that is different across diff different areas in the country, so if you take somewhere like Latakia and Tartus, school attendance rate is around 90%. If you look at somewhere like Aleppo, it's, it's close to zero. So that the long-term implications of that, that the, the current divisions within Syrian society are being reinforced by, will be reinforced in the future, uh, because of the loss of school term, uh, because of the number of school years lost, so that will be actually very difficult to make up for school term. The same is uh, the same is ha also happening in the in this in higher education. Uh, there's been many many students are deferring their, their higher education at current time uh, because of the instability and and, and lack of uh, well, they don't know wh where they'll be. Many of them are having to travel long distance to be at university, so their families are not wishing them to travel. This is particularly tr true for, uh, for women students who, whose families want them at hand, they don't want them far from the family. So education has now been deferred in many areas. Um, and also you have, a, you have the same problem as you have in the healthcare sector. You have, uh, you have, the, fl you have the, the flight of, of many professors and um, and teachers from the education system, again as refugees, as migrants, and as internally displaced, so they have no longer access to, to, to their employment. Um, one of the big factors uh, that's, that's happening is the, educa the education system, the public healthcare, the public healthcare system, and, public, and the, public, the public sector generally 
uh, the population, the, 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 the employees are all on fixed incomes. And their incomes are not going, uh, basically their incomes only stretch half as far as they used to. So that's also creating a crisis for the government because uh, government, government support depends very much on people having employment and so that their lives are not being completely ruined by the situation. So the government has, has been pushing up, pushed up salaries in the, the past period. That will, but that's going to impact negatively on, on, on the debt ratio of the government because that's been rising quite dramatically as well. So the national debt is about 174% currently of, of, GD, of, of GDP. That's being financed both internally from local sources and from uh, and from international loans, mainly from uh, mainly from Iran and the Soviet Union, but primarily Iran. So that is a factor that's going to affect the the government um, in the future. Um, so the sustainability of the economy is is really in is in some serious doubt, um, and I think that is really really the, the one of the main the main the main factors that will affect the future. Um, now. What we have been, one of the reasons why we are looking, why we are doing these reports is a lot, there's a lot of international assistance going in at the moment to support the humanitarian situation. So mainly in food aid, health um, healthcare, um, cash assistance for the poor and the most needy. But one of the problems we are seeing is that people are losing any sort of ability to man maintain livelihoods. I mean, uh, we are now talking about millions of people without any source of, of income. What we also see uh, on the ground is a massive rise in informality. So there's been a huge rise in the informal sector where people are trading um, fruits and vegetables. So many people have opened up these micro-entrepreneurship activities which are creating a basic income for the families, but it's not sufficient to sustain the families at a, at a reasonable level. So really, these are just coping strategies to living in poverty. Um, the other big factor in the economy, there has been a significant rise in economies of violence. So there's a lot, uh, there's significant amount of economic violence, and politics of economic violence, uh, mainly through extortion, racketeering, Kidnapping and, and various other elements, which are, uh, which are extremely, which are pushing out in many areas, making it very difficult for regular business people to survive. And, and in that context, there's been in certain areas, there's been uh, the contract law has been dissolving very rapidly. So it's very difficult to, to operate in, a, in a, an economy where. Where, where there's violence and extortion going on and trying to run a regular business. So uh, business networks are also collapsing. Um, if I don't know if I should go into the sectoral analysis or, or not, but there's some key, I mean, industry is, is really reduced by about 70%. The, the transport sector is also down, um, mainly because of the danger of transportation. So transp people don't travel travel very much throughout the, uh, within the country. So people have reduced their travel needs as much as possible because the possibility of, of being of being kidnapped or, or held at checkpoints. Um, also, uh, there's been a lot of a lot of hijacking of of vehicles transporting goods and services. In the agricultural sector, there's been a large loss of livestock um, as livestock has been. Uh, has been looted, and the agricultural sector, although it's become the biggest sector of the economy, it is also facing a in huge increase in price uh, in prices for uh, for for inputs for f fertilizers, insecticides, and um, and sewage uh, uh, sorry um, water system water management systems. So the, the whole economy is really uh, I, uh, the only thing word we can use to describe it. As in we can say it's in recession, but really it's more in a state of ruination. Than recession. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. I, this is um, obviously a very depressing picture. Um, hard for many of us to hear, um, but good to to understand the 
this this side of the picture because we we frequently are just hearing the side of of the fighting um, and the future of Syria obviously is a big question um, and I'd like to get your perspective a little bit if you could step away from sort of your particular role in, in, in reporting as as uh, in the context of, of this effort um, looking looking forward to what perhaps could be I mean, you, you mentioned some coping strategies but but what could we do to to help mitigate um, mitigate the, the, the economic uh, downslide um, I in the scenario of continued protracted conflict? Well, I, I mean, there's many things, I think there's many things that can be done, but th they're all very, they're not going to generate huge income, they're not going to generate growth, they're, they're basically be coping instruments that would help communities build livelihoods, maintain livelihoods, and that can be small scale that can be small, uh, public, small scale public work activities, community based public work activities within communities that can hold together and work together. Um, and so that can, generate, that can generate income. It can also generate local purchasing power. It can help small businesses within the community to get together. So, for example, if you're working to repair um, Des destroy buildings. You can uh, you can either do that through through self help projects within the community by providing materials and support for community members and households to rebuild and re and replenish uh, windows, um, waterworks, and various other things. Or you can actually you can scale it up a little bit and employ small scale jobbing builders to do repair and maintenance. That puts money into the economy locally. It also means you, you buy materials for, for, from local companies, local businesses, local, <coughs> local um, shops, which generates a sort of an internal economy. <coughs> but these issues are, these are extremely limited because, I mean, they're not reflooring the economy. They're just keeping certain communities um, with a basic means of sustaining livelihoods. But humanitarians have not, have not really, in all of the humanitarian situations around the globe, They've never really been able to find this mixture of being able to work with humanitarian assistance and at the same time livelihood support and maintain a focus on human development. And that's one of the things we, we want this report to do is to keep a focus on human development issues so they don't get lost um, when governments and, and others are looking at the situation <coughs> because often we only see what's going on through the prism of the two warring parties and the people supporting the two warring parties. What we're trying to show in this report is the impact of the, the armed conflict on the lives and livelihoods of ordinary Syrians. And I think uh, when you see the data and you see the extent of the data, uh, it's, 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 extremely, it's extremely disturbing for the future and the future livelihoods of, 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 of people and particularly young people who are, are most at risk in this situation. Okay, we have uh, about 25 minutes left, so I'll open it up to the audience to ask questions. We have one here in the front row. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abbas Khanan from the Embassy of Iraq. Uh, what you say here, uh, first, thanks for the, an excellent presentation. Uh, what you really say here brings flashbacks from my home country back in the 2005, 2000, maybe even four, five, six, seven. My question is uh, this, uh, there is a lot of focus, as you mentioned, both on the, uh, on, on the fight and the outcome of the fight and the political aspect of it. But from a, an economic perspective, uh, what, what comes to mind is what does uh, this, the current situation economically leave for uh, whoever is going to be following Assad or for Assad himself if he survives in terms of maintaining a solvent uh, government or regime, economically speaking, uh, given what you said, that it would take 30 years to bring Syria back at the rate, growth rate of 5% to, uh, to, to the uh, kind of the, the situation that was before the conflict, bearing in mind that the situation before the conflict was not that great as well. I mean, in Iraq, we had the oil and $100 billion income, but Syria doesn't have that luxury. So if, if you want to reflect on that for, for us, that would be appreciated. 
Yeah, I mean, look, at any reconstruction period, it's not going to be five. I mean, in a, in a period of immediate reconstruction, you might actually have 100 and 100 100 percent growth on the current level because there'll be one would assume that would be vast sums of money coming in, <laughs> that there'd be a mobilization of expatriate capital, uh, that be money coming in for the business community, that businesses would be encouraged to 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 invest. Um, particularly from the expatriate community who's not lived in Syria. So, I mean, similar to, I, I mean, if I use the example of Palestine, at the beginning of the peace process in Palestine, you had a large inflow of, of both foreign capital and expatriate Palestinian capital that, that boosted the economy for a number of years. So, so you had quite significant growth, 20, 30 percent growth over a very short period of time. But again, it's not just, in Syria you're looking at, uh, you're looking at investments of hundreds of billions of dollars to refloat the economy. And again, that depends on the, the type of political settlement you have. Um, first, the institutional structure is in some disarray. Uh, the Ba'ath Party, for example, is still a strong institutional structure within Syria, but it is, it's, it's a hollow shell of what it used to be. Uh, so. The, the main thing going forward is how do you, how do you re-energize the institutional structure in Syria to make them capable of being part of the, of the reflotation of the, of the economy. And I think, I mean, again, that depends on the type of political settlement that's arrived at in the future. Well, and it also seems that the country, if you look at the country now, I mean, there are different uh, conditions prevailing in different parts of, of the country, and there's been more destruction in, in certain areas or different cities than others. Um, and so the industrial base may be more in a better position to be revived in, uh, in one part of the country rather than others. Um, you know, so it, it, it seems to me that there also would need to be some thinking about w where interventions may be yeah. best be sustainable. Um, do you have a sense right now where w what parts of Syria are, well, are doing better than others? Well, I mean, it's very clear the parts are doing better. Latakia, Tutus, and um, Sweda are, have been largely immune from the conflict. And I, I mean, I'll, I'll just say we have. In Syria, we had five microfinance branch offices, f uh, four in Damascus, one in Aleppo. Uh, our branch office in Aleppo was closed. It was on the front line, so we had to close it and move the staff somewhere else. In Duma, our office is, is closed. In Saida Sa Zainab, our office is closed. And, and Yarmouk, our office is closed. So we had one up until a few months ago, Your we had in Damascus. yeah, we had one operating off office in Damascus, and we then we opened three new branch offices in Tartus, Sweda, and um, Latakia, and those have grown very significantly within a very short period of time. So there are pockets of the where there's still contract law is still in operation, policing systems are in operation, so you can continue regular contract. You've also had a, a large outflow of business people from Aleppo to Latakia, but they're not operating in any way close to the nature they were when they were in Aleppo. And if you take Aleppo, Aleppo was one of the main industrial centers of the country, um, and it had very strong economic links to Turkey. Those links are, have all been severed. Many of the business people have, particularly the Armenian business community, have left have left Aleppo, many have gone, some have gone to Latakia, many have gone, gone to Armenia. So re, it's not just a case of putting money in, you have to build the previous marketing networks uh, that were there in the past. And it's not clear that those can be reestablished very easily because when one market link breaks up, the dominant partners tend to create new market links and they, they just don't go back to the old marketing links. So I think it's going to be a very difficult process to to put together. Um, so I, I, that again, and that depends again depends very much on the nature of the political settlement because these things tend to be trade links tend to have very strong political dimensions to them. Can you introduce? 
Say your name. Hi, good morning. My name is Bassam Barabendi. I'm a Syrian. Uh, how the Assad regime can sponsor or support or finance the army, taking in consideration all the figures that you mentioned? It, it seems there's no income. There is still, I mean, uh, there's not no income. Uh, there's about, I mean, uh, about five billion has been, ha I mean, from all the data we have, we reckon there's about five billion been moved from public good, for example, social services, healthcare, education, has been moved to military <laughs> purposes. So, I mean, by the very nature of, of, a, of a country being in a war situation, it's the government's going to put as much money into, is going to prioritize putting money into, into military expenditures to, to achieve what it's trying to achieve. And so, I mean, they're looking, they're looking very much at the short-term issues on that. They're not really, they, they don't currently have a focus on the long-term development issues. I mean, it's mostly about winning the war and surviving uh, from, an econ uh, from an economic perspective. Um, but at some point, they're, um, they're going to have to look at this because, because the economy is becoming increasingly unsustainable, that's going to have significant impact on the government because the government depends on maintaining a, uh, a workforce who depend on it for, for their living. And if they can't sustain that, that will create um, critical challenges for them in the future. And that requires, that basically requires continuing subvention, either direct, direct aid from, um, from allies or, from, or, or, or foreign credits from their allies. Third row, back from the back, um, from the front. Sorry. Yeah, here. Thank you. Uh, my sense is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that of the funds going in, you know, in support of those, you know, who have, for who have left their homes, whether migrating, uh, refugees, or internally displaced, that a large portion of the so the, of those funds are going you know, to support the refugees in Jordan and Lebanon for understandable reasons. It must be very difficult, you know, to do. But the, uh, on the other hand, the internally displaced population is quite huge. I mean, is that correct? And do we have any sense of how the internal, if it is correct, you know, the, how the internally displaced populations are faring and how they're coping? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, the internally displaced are displaced both in the areas where, uh, which are under the opposition control and they're displaced in areas under, under government control. For the UN, we don't, we don't have the authorization to do cross-border um, support, so we, we, have, uh, we have very little impact in the, a in, the a in the opposition areas because we're basically, in order for us to operate, we have to, we have to work through, currently still have to work through 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 government permission to serve areas which they allow us to work in, and that is mainly in areas controlled by them. And in general, there's the substantial aid going into all areas. Now, of course, the the level of need and and the amount of money available, there's no match between them. There's significant gaps. So people are not getting what they need to survive, but they're getting a minimum that's helping them mitigate the poverty they're living in, but it's certainly not providing for the full range of needs. Now, in the opposition areas, there are also NGOs and other wor others working there, um, although I, I don't have any idea of the volume and value and the actual, how widespread it is, but on both sides, there's people in great need with insufficient uh, support going to them. I mean, just to point out, as, as you mentioned, I mean, there's some six million internally displaced, and some of those people are in camps and you know very particular uh, areas, locations, and many of them are just living with uh, families yeah. and um, are internally displaced within cities. You know, some people moving uh, continuously. So they, so some, I imagine, are still part of whatever economic activity is, is still left, whereas others are probably very much dependent on 
on the humanitarian aid, whether they're in the opposition area or on the border camps? Well, I think there's two things with the internally displaced that you have to look at. You have internally displaced people who have no source of income whatsoever, so they've lost their jobs and lost their livelihoods. You have other internally displaced people who have lost their homes and have had to move from, uh, from their communities, but they still have employment. So the, the difference in the quality of life between the two groups is very dramatic. So I mean, I just came back from Damascus last week, and when I was in Damascus, you see big family households, but also you see in most of the parks in Damascus, there are displaced people sleeping in the parks. Um, so every night there's uh, hundreds in some of the parks, thousands of people just living there uh, on a, without any other means of livelihood or support. Now they're getting, they're getting food, some food and blanket distribution and things like that from NGOs and others, but the difference within the, the, within the internally displaced communities, the difference between the people themselves are, are, are very diverse based on if they have income sources or not. Do you have any sense of, of what percentage of the population is, are still collecting state salaries? Um, I think a large segment, a large segment of the state sector is still collecting salaries. Many of what we know, what, what Do you I have know a from figure? my experience, I don't have a figure, but what I know from my, many, many people have sent their families outside the country and they, they continue to work in the government. So if, they're, if they're, they send their families to Lebanon, uh, they go down to Lebanon every uh, every other weekend to to see their families. So people are are staying working um, just to create income, so that they're keeping their families o outside the country. Okay. Uh, we had a question here, and then over there. Hugh McElrath, retired intelligence officer. Irrespective of political or patriotic or religious motivation. To what extent is it a rational economic decision for a military age man to join armed or paramilitary forces on either side in order, say, to support a family? Well, I, I mean, if you're, I, I think it's a fairly rational choice. Uh, I mean, you see militias all over the world. And in places of violent conflict, they're often the only way you can actually support and sustain your family. So, I mean, there's, there's an economic not just ideological sort of determinant of why people would fight on, 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 um, if they're getting money to fight and there's no other source of income, then it happens. We've seen it for years in Palestinian camps in Lebanon. People would join different militias at different time because they would get income from, from being part of a militia. And I think that's the same thing. And as I say, with economies of violence, often there's, there are groups who actually live off what they can take uh, from communities to survive. And again, that gives legitimacy to, to how they survive. Okay, we had a question in the, on my far right, middle row. Chris. Uh, Chris Straub from the Amar Foundation. The, those state salaries, and I presume military salaries on the regime side as well, are being paid in Syrian pounds. Yeah. So what's, what's the um, trajectory of the Syrian pound w if, the, if this current economic slide continues, and when does it become completely valueless? Okay, well, the uh, I'll just give you some of the data on it. When the conflict started, the, the equivalent value of the Syrian pound was around 50 Syrian pounds to one US dollar. It's currently... 170, 170, 169 Syrian pound to one US dollar. So you've had massive devaluation in terms of the value of the currency. Um, a, a few, it had gone up to 300 um, about a, a few months ago, but the, the central bank has managed to get it back to 179. Now it's been like that for about Three months. So what? Was, uh, three months. And so there's some stability in the currency because it was it was really shooting up for quite a while. But now the the, the management of it has been brought it down to to a stable situation. Whether it can sustain that stable situation remains to be seen. But um, but that's an indication also that um, that the government has some sort of stability within. It's f the fiscal processes it's op operating. It's been controlling. I mean, there's, there's a number of parallel markets in, 
in the country. So the, the, the gap between the parallel mar the black market and the, and, and, the, and the official exchange rate has come down dramatically. So in fact, for a, f for a few, d uh, last, last week when I was in Syria, the official exchange rate was actually higher than the black market rate for the first time ever. So there is some, they're bringing some control into the into currency and exchange exchange rates at the moment, but there's no guarantee that that can be sustained over the long term. And over the long term, you would think it wouldn't be. One would expect to see, in that context, to see some form of dollarization of the currency ongoing, but so far it's, it's not really happening. And the, the central bank has been very, has put a lot of pressure on merchants and others not to start pegging their peg in trading to 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 dollar rates um, but yeah it's a factor but I at the moment it's not it's not a destabilizing factor but I think and and over the long term it will be um, but as I said before it's, uh, the big factor is the cost of living the cost of living has risen by 200 percent it's likely to rise to 300 percent and if you're on a fixed income like, as most state state employees are that means you're, you, you just can't live the way you used to before. Now, fuel prices are, are doubling, food prices are doubling, um, basic commodity prices are, 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 are inflating. So it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's that is a destabilizing factor for the government. The government is giving food still giving food subsidies for basic commodities. It's still procuring goods from farmers at at fixed prices, so th so th they've they've still got some they've still got some elements of fiscal control <coughs> on the general economy, but the general economy is not gener generating the the well the the income that can actually float the tax base. So the tax base is is declining quite dramatically, which means the ability to the government to invest is uh, in, is going down. Now the government expenditure has growing. Um, there's three elements of growth in the GDP, GDP which have continued over this period. One is public se sector expenditures, the other uh, is, is service expenditures, and the other uh, growth sector is uh, NGOs. So NGO, the, the NGO uh, share of GDP has grown. It's still, it's still s a small share of GDP, but it shows that most of the service sector today, which is still the growth pole, still a growth pole in the economy, it's all focused on providing humanitarian assistance to millions of people. But that again is not a, it's not a, it's not a positive economic tr trade. It's actually a negative economic trade because that money has to come from somewhere uh, to serve non-productive purposes. Uh, we just have a couple yes, yes, yes. minutes uh, left, so I'll take, how many questions do we have left? Just one? Okay. You talked a little bit about the impact of the informal market locally. I was wondering if you could talk some about whether the team had any estimates about what its impact has been um, sort of as a broader network, both black market trade, smuggling, um, and sort of how much of the economy has been made up in, in that market. Well, uh, First of all, the the informal economy, uh, and I'm not talking about the, not I'm talking about the economy within the major cities. That is mainly is mainly is mainly trading. So it's it's mainly trade. So there's not it's not creating it's not creating additional value. It's just it's just sharing value between an increasing number of people. So you're just chopping the cake into smaller and smaller pieces and people are getting a part of that which is allowing them to survive. But there's very little within the, f within the informal economy that can be seen as productive in nature. I mean there's some, some home-based manufacturing, um, crafts, food processing, things like that, but all on a very, very small scale. You have household production going on, um, small animal husbandry raising, basically to, to supplement um, nutritional requirements. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's so far, it's not very much of it's entering the market for sale. I've heard that the oil uh, production, which uh, used to uh, compromise 25% of yeah. the, the GDP, um, has also become informalized. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the government, I mean, well, the state oil industries, that was the main source of hard currency. That has gone completely because most uh, most of the oil wells are in areas controlled by the opposition. Um, now th there's been a lot of um, l let me say smuggling of oil across borders, and it's been controlled by by different groups. 
not necessarily controlled in a unified way, but very divided among each other. Uh, the oil petroleum level has just has gone down, I think, to around 14,000 barrels a day. So it's, it's shrunk by about 75%. Also, the oil wells have been have also been destroyed and the and the petroleum producing plants have been destroyed so there's been large scale destruction of the the ability to produce petroleum and and other products from the, so mostly the, it's the export of of um, of of raw ma unprocessed materials now uh, okay well um thank you alex for for um coming here today and for sharing your expertise um again the uh, the latest report is available outside. I, I suspect that some people may wish to receive future copies because you're doing these reports on a quarterly yeah. basis. Um, and might you tell us how we can find them? Yeah, well, the, the, reports, are, uh, the reports are released on the, on the website. On our website? Yeah. Um, and on our dot uh, org. Uh, yeah. On okay. a, but also the Syria um, Center for Policy Research will be producing the report in Arabic, and so it will be available on Arabic on, on its website. Okay. Uh -huh. What about the Palestinian people? Do they have Palestinian? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, the yeah. Uh, the Palestinian Syrians are, are I mean, a sm very small part of the Syrian population, right? We're talking about just under half a million people, but where they are located geog geographically means that proportionately they have suffered more than people in general. Um, so, I mean, they're mainly in places like Dera, Homs, Hama, um, um, and more, most particularly the place where they've been hardest hit has been in Yermok, where half the uh, Palestine refugee population in Syria live. I mean, I could just give you some because uh, we've just done a survey of the clients we have, our microfinance clients. So if I take the, the case of Yermok, 88.8% of our clients in Yermok were displaced. 45% of them had, had their homes and houses damaged or destroyed. 45% of them had their businesses looted and robbed. Um, cut only 14% still had an operating business. So I mean, most of them have lost their, 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 their sources of income. The majority of the Palestinian population from, from Yermuk are living uh, outside Yermuk. 43,000 43, registered in Lebanon, uh, just about 10% of the population. Another 8,000 in Jordan. Um, so quite a proportion, proportionally high share of Palestinians have been have been hit, but as I say, in terms of the in terms of the overall situation, they're they're in a better condition than, than many people because they do have direct support um, in Lebanon and in, in Jordan. If they can reach those. Places. If they can reach those places, um, but we're still operating. Our operations are still going on and homes and Hama and Aleppo, so we still have operations taking place in all of the areas where Palestinian refugees are located. So they're still getting food aid, cash assistance, um, medical help. Mostly schools are still functioning. Uh, some areas not, but, uh, but so they've still got direct access to services. But the most, the most difficult place was Yermuk, where it's estimated that only a very small percentage of Palestine refugees remain in remain in remain in Yermuk. Uh, okay, okay. We have consensus to take one more question. If you can be brief, please. Yes, thank you, Molly Williamson, Middle East Institute. Uh, what kind of cooperation or scrutiny uh, do you have for your operations? from the Syrian government? Uh, we, I mean, we work with UNRWA. We work, our direct partner in the Syrian government is GAPAR, uh, which is the General Association for Palestinian Refugees in Syria. So everything we do, we coordinate with GAPAR. Um, and our coordination has gone on, uh, has been going on essentially since the 50s. And so uh, we, we have a very, I th I'd say, in terms of coordination to deliver services, we have very good cooperation 
uh, with, uh, with that government agency. Okay. Thank you again, Alex. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you.